April the 6th, 1951, the following ad appeared in the Commercial Appeal in Memphis, Tennessee. A son born to Mr. and Mrs. R. L. Tant. Later, I became Charlie Russell Ellison, much later. I um, grew up thinking that I was just an Ellison. I did not know any different, even though I heard whisperings at time. You'd hear things like uh, when you was around family, sometimes you'd hear somebody whisper, is that that adopted boy? And I couldn't figure all that out. One time when I was in about the fifth grade um, in Memphis, Tennessee, a friend of mine, Peanut Smith, him and I were just kind of laying out on the playground, and he said, I know something you don't know. And um, anyway, he said, uh, we're cousins. I said, really? What do you mean by that? And he's, he said, you're adopted. And he went with the story, and I don't remember what all the story was now. been too long ago. Well, I didn't appreciate him lying to me like that. But I uh, found out later he wasn't lying. I came home one time after that, and I'd made a bad grade at school, and I was upset. And, and I just came home and, and asked my mama, I said, uh, am I adopted? And she said, certainly not. I'm not sure why they kept that from me. That's their business, not mine. I'm not sure the reason for that. It's not a good thing, though, but when you get old enough, you need to know the truth. You, you really do. My mother's biological mother's name was uh, Betty Tant. Her maiden name was Barrett. Uh, I am actually named after my grandfather, who's actually Barrett in Houston, Texas, Charlie Russell Barrett. I think his wife's name was Lily May, I believe. And um, I um, did not ever meet much of that family. I did meet. Uh, my biological mother when I was, I, I don't know, I think Linda and I may have been married when I met her, I can't recall now, but um, my father, I never did know him um, according to the commercial appeal, according to the original birth certificate, his name was Raymond Tant, and um, he was killed in an automobile accident in when he was just 30 some odd years old. I have never been certain that Raymond Tant was my biological father. Um, my mother Betty says that he he was. She assured me that he was. Um, I think they. Um, anyway, long story um, that I won't go into detail about. To, but legally, he was. And later, when I was adopted, the juvenile court came in and took us. In and later when it was adopted, uh, Raymond had to sign release papers, or whatever you call that, for me to be adopted. I found something yesterday that was a little bit disturbing, and, and that was my, I have a sister named Beverly, biological sister, and um, we grew up thinking we was cousins. She was adopted by, um, Mary Francis and Robert Ellison, and I was adopted by Evelyn and uh, Sidney Ellison, and we grew up, at least I thought we was cousins. She knew different, but later I found out she was my, uh, my sister. But anyway, she found something uh, a couple of three days ago, and it was a, a marriage certificate of when Raymond married uh, a lady by the name of Adabel. I can't recall the last name. They got married in November of 1950. And I thought, well, I, no wonder he never did claim me because he was already married to another woman at the time of my birth. And I, I kind of understand that. We aren't going through the process just actually this past week. We're running to some tents, and, and uh, I'd visited with some of them several years ago, and uh, they didn't know anything about me and didn't want to know anything about me. It was, uh, they had no desire to know anything about me. But... Um, um, we found a uh, brother of Raymond, who's 74 years old now, lives in Flippin, Arkansas, that really would, would like to help us to find out if, if Raymond was the father. So 
we're doing in DNA, and we'll know something about eight weeks to know eight weeks. And either Raymond is or he's not. No big deal. But I, but I'd like to know who my ancestors was. My son daughter would like to know as well. So we'll see how how all that turns out. Betty uh, just was not a. Uh, um, uh, she just wasn't a good mother, and she liked to honky tonk and run around with guys and messed around with a lot of different men back then. And as a result of that, that's how when they found us, we was at the home all by ourselves. Beverly was a year old. I was just a little bitty baby. She was about a year and a half old, I guess. And I was just a little bitty baby, and we was all by ourselves at home. And my older brother found us, and my adopted brother, and that's how all this came about. I am an Ellison, by the way through the bloodline uh, because uh, Betty was, um, um, anyway, long story, I am an Ellison on my um, mother's side, anyway, so that, that's a cool thing, for me it is, anyway. Um, I found out for sure that I was adopted when I was about 15 years old, and what I did, my dad and I, Sidney Ellison, and by the way, let me just make this very clear, my real People say, well, who are your real parents? My parents, my real parents are Sidney and Evelyn Ellison. It takes uh, much more to be a parent than conceive a child. And that's who I believe my real parents are. Uh, they raised me and loved me. And um, my father and I, we was going someplace one time. I must have been about 15. And so I approached him, and I shared this in my last testimony. I uh, said, Dad, do you like history? And he said, yes. And I said, well, when you study history, don't you want to know all of it? And he didn't know where I was going. I said, Daddy, I want to know my history, where I came from. So uh, I think I pushed him in a corner, and there wasn't anything he could do but just tell me, and he did, shared with me my history. and. He told me he had no idea who my dad was, but he did talk to me about who my mom was. And anyway, it, it kind of helped me to understand just a little bit. I uh, came home, he went into the house, I followed, and he told Evelyn, my real mom, well, Charlie knows now, and she, he explained what he meant by that, and she started crying. And she looked at me and she says, well, I don't guess she will love me anymore, and I said, Mom, I love you more than ever. You had to raise these other youngins, but you chose to raise me because they had other children as well. And uh, so that did not affect my relationship with, with uh, my real mom and dad at all. Maybe loved them a little bit more. Uh, Beverly and I have gotten extremely closer uh, in, in, in recent years. A lot of things that were worked on. We've got a, a lot of things in common. Um, I wasn't raised in church. Evelyn and Sydney was good people, good, good people. My dad taught me a lot of stuff, uh, but I wasn't raised in church, and every once in a while we would go, but it was very, very rarely. But I do remember one particular time that, that uh, we went, and it was the Gray Road Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, and me and my brother James, who's eight years older than I, when I say brother, that's my adopted brother, and I, but anyway, we were sitting toward the back about where Carl was sitting, and my mom and somebody else was sitting up in this way, and during the invitation, my mom turned around and motioned for us to go forward. Later, I found out that she wasn't motioning for me to go, she was motioning for James to go, and so we went, we came forward, and um, I, I was probably only... I don't know, eight or ten years old, I'm not sure. And the pastor asked James first, uh, do you, I don't remember all the questions, but something about do you want to go to heaven? And he asked me as well, and what would, what would boys say? Sure, we want to go to heaven. Do you want to go to hell? No. You, all you got to do is ask Jesus to save you, and he'll save you. And so he said, just pray and, and, and ask Jesus to save you, and he will, and, and we did. And after we got through praying, he said, did you ask Jesus to save you? And I said, James said yes, and I said yes, and he said, you're saved. There's only one problem with that. There was no conviction. 
I had no idea what I was doing. All I did was speak words. But now he says I'm saved, so I must be saved. A couple of weeks later, I was baptized. So that was pretty much my experience on salvation for several years until we moved to um, West Memphis, Arkansas. I was a, a rebellious teenager in Memphis. I grew up and um, started drinking when I was about 14 years old, real, real heavy. And I had gotten into some serious trouble. I'd, I had um, been arrested a couple of times. And um, the uh, juvenile court had advised my father that he really needed to get me out of Memphis. I had uh, really done some bad stuff in, in Memphis by the time I was about 15 years old. Um, very, very bad. Actually, I'd been arrested twice, I do recall now for sure. And uh, both of them alcohol related. Excuse me, my mind's coming back. Three times I was arrested. One time it was for burglary, uh, breaking into a store to steal some money so that I could pay my paper bill that I had blown on something else. But um, all I know is we decided to move to West Memphis, Arkansas. And I didn't know until mi many years later the reason for that move was to protect me because the judge had told my father that if he didn't get me out of Memphis, they're fixing to lock me up. And um, I think that was a cool thing for a father to do, don't you? To raise up his family and move them to another city for his child. I wished I would have known that back then. You don't know how much I wished I would have known that because, see, I didn't think nobody loved me back then. I didn't think Evelyn Ellison loved me. I'd heard some arguments about some stuff. Kids hear things. Listen to me, mom and dad, grandparents. You may not think kids hear, but kids hear that fight at night. Kids hear those words. And I don't understand the reason for this, but kids think it's their fault. And I thought it was my fault because I do remember something that my mom said one time about me that how things would have been much better if I had not come into the home. And I just grew up, you know, not knowing if anybody cared. But um, we moved to West Memphis and and when I was about 16, there were about, um, I found a cute girl down the street. Her name was Sarah. And um, started going down there to see her some. And later her father said to me that, you know, if you want to come down here and see Sarah, you're welcome to, but you, you've got to go to church with us. Because he knew that I did not go to church. And that was no big deal to me, you know. I like church. So I started going to church with them, and uh, it was I enjoyed church. I joined the church on promise of letter. You remember, I'd already been saved and baptized, supposedly, right? So I joined the church and started going there and got active in the church. Keep in mind, I, this is the kind of Christian I was. Not really a Christian, but this is the kind of church member I was. Maybe I should say that. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then the rest of the days I would get drunk and drank. But that's the kind of church member I was. Um, well, we had a revival meeting, and the pastor, his name was Mike Harmon. I do recall his name. I remember who he was. He preached on Monday through Friday. Friday night he preached on hell. And uh, literally he scared the hell out of me. We left that service, we started home, and I began to cry. And Sarah asked me what was wrong with me, and I said, I don't know if I'm saved. And she said, well, Charlie, if you were saved, you would know it. And I said, I don't. And she asked if I wanted to go talk to the pastor, and I said, I do. So we went over to the pastor's home and in his kitchen, on my knees, I truly put my trust in Jesus Christ. I don't remember what I prayed, 
But let me tell you now, what you pray is not important. It's what's in your heart. Salvation is the result of believing and trusting, understanding that you was lost, and I knew I was on my way to hell. Many times since that date, I have doubted my salvation. I'm talking about many, many times. But I can always go back to that point, and I know that's when I put my trust in Jesus Christ. By the way, I haven't doubted in many, many, many years, but the long time I used to doubt. And one of the reasons I used to doubt it so much is because, and uh, this is tough, but there wasn't a major change in my lifestyle even after salvation. And I don't understand the reason why. But I, I would stop drinking, then I'd start again, and I'd stop drinking, and I would start again. And uh, that went on all the, all the way up to when I was at the age of about 24. However, at the age of 18, you heard Linda's testimony a couple of weeks ago. Um, we met. Now, let me tell you how I was thinking back then. I was not a good guy, but I wanted to make sure the girl that I married was good. I mean, she had to be. I had a criteria. I would date a lot of girls. And um, I would get in trouble sometimes because I would forget which one I'm supposed to go out with when. And, um, but I had already knew that none of those girls would ever be my wife because I, I go ahead and tell you, they, wasn't, they just wasn't good enough. Wasn't good enough. But when I met Linda, I met a good, decent girl. And I thought, this is, this is her. It was odd that we met that night. We just happened to be at the same place at the same time. She was circling this little hamburger joint in West Memphis, Arkansas, and I saw her, and I thought, wow, look at that 68 white Mustang. Hmm. That's a pretty car. And it was a pretty girl driving it as well. She weighed 88 pounds, beautiful eyes, all oh, short hair, just as cute as she could be. And um, so I think she told you I went up to her window and I said, hey, haven't I seen you someplace before? You know, it, it worked. Long story short, we met on June the 1st. That was her 20th birthday. And um, we got married August the 29th. Very decent girl. Um, very decent girl. She, be, she has become a fantastic wife, a great mother to my children, because that was one thing. I want, why, you say, why did you want to marry somebody so good? Because I wanted to make sure they'd be a good mama. Remember, I didn't have a good mama. Evelyn Ellison did the best that she could, but she was a drug addict. And a drug addict just aren't, is not a good mama at all times. And it was tough at home because of her drug. You know, my biological mother was had alcohol problems, my adopted mother had drug problems, it was tough. And I wanted a good woman for my children. If God gave me children, I didn't see any reason why he would not, and that, that did happen. I praise God for it. Well, I was a terrible husband. I tell everybody that my wife's first husband was a total jerk, and then I changed. But I was a total jerk. I did things that I should not have done, a lot of things. I continued to drink every day. Now, I was a, the type drinker that I was, uh, what, what do you call it, a functional drunk? I, I think that's what you call it. I would, I would work, but as soon as I got, got off, buddy, I would hit it. Uh, I would hit it, and um, it, was, it was terrible. This is hard for some people to understand, but God began to deal with me to preach. I was unchurched, I was not living a Christian life. Why in the world would God pick a guy to preach that was not churched, not living a Christian life, not living a good life, a lousy husband, a lousy father? Why would he pick a guy like that to preach? You'd have to ask him. I can't answer that question. But God began to deal with me about that. And, and my biggest problem was uh, I was such a bad guy. I knew I was a bad guy. 
and uh, I had educational problems. I didn't tell you that I'd failed the sixth grade, I'd failed the seventh grade, I'd failed the eighth grade, I was going to fail it the second time. I said, this is enough, I'm out of here, and I quit. So I had no education, um, had dropped out of the eighth grade. I um, could not speak plain. Uh, you, th you think I've got speech problems now, you should have heard me back then. I, a lot of words I could not say. Um, I could not hardly read. I could not hardly write. I was just in bad shape. Why would God call a guy like me to preach? That was my biggest deal. And, um, but anyway, uh, she had a family. We finally moved to Cornyn, Arkansas. I was always able to get a great job. I could, I could get fantastic jobs. I was a professional salesperson, and man, I could sell anything, and, and I was good at it, extremely good at it. And I was a good worker. Just I was just a lousy everything else, and and um, so we moved to Corn in Arkansas. I started managing an exterminating company there for another guy, and and um, some of her family started after us about coming to church, and we started going. And buddy, the call to preach started heavy again. The first time God really hit me hard. Again, this is hard for people to understand, and whoever listens to this video that don't don't know me. Um, will doubt it, but I'll go ahead and tell you, the first time that God called me to preach, I was as drunk as a skunk. But don't you, th let me tell you something right now. God speaks to drunks as well. And uh, when we started going to church went in Sunday school, something was said, I don't even remember what it was, but it was that day that I said, I'm going to surrender my life to God, to my heart, to God, and I did. That was March of 1976. I surrendered my life to God. I answered the call to preach. One of the best things I've ever done in my entire life. I um, moved my family from in Arkansas to Little Rock, Arkansas that fall to attend the Missionary Baptist Seminary. And you remember how bad I was in school? A D was a good grade. When I went to the seminary, I made straight A's. And it was a whole lot harder. But boy, did I have a passion for what we was doing. Every subject, with the exception of English, which I hated, but I uh, still made an A in it. Since then, I've attended three different seminaries. God called me to preach. God called me to pastor. My first church was in Calico Rock, Arkansas. I went up there to pastor those people. $40 a week. And um, that must have been about 1978, 1979. So you still know $40 a week is not a whole lot of money. I moved my whole family up there and started pastoring that church, started working full-time. And I don't know how God did it. Well, I do know how he did it because he can do the impossible. My whole testimony is about what God can do with what man thinks is no good. God can take something that is no good and make something different out of it. But he, he grew that church. We went from just a handful of people. I don't know what we had when we first went up there. Linda could tell you, 15 or 20 or so, maybe even not that many. And uh, it, in a year, we was, we was hitting 100 and sometimes even more. I couldn't tell you how many people were saved and baptized. One of the reasons I think God did so much is because I had to let him do it because I had no idea how to do it. I remember the first time I baptized, it was two twin girls accepted Christ as our Savior. We, went, we was going to go to the creek that Sunday afternoon and baptize those twin girls. My biggest concern was which hand am I supposed to raise? I, I'm serious about that. I, I had no idea. Am I supposed to raise the right hand? Am I supposed to raise the left hand? I searched the scriptures and I thought, hmm, they don't say neither one. So apparently it's not important. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing. I, I knew absolutely nothing. That, that church was a, was a uh, boot camp for my ministry. The church was in terrible condition when I got there. They had a deacon that did not believe in the security of the believer. They had a Sunday school teacher that did not believe in the Lord's Supper. Now, let me, let me make this clear. 
it wasn't that he believed in open or closed communion. He just didn't believe in the Lord's Supper. He said, that's something the Apostle Paul started. God didn't start that. And I thought, what? That was the Sunday school superintendent and teacher. Deacon did not believe in security of the believer and a bunch of other stuff. And here's a guy that didn't know how to do anything, and God used him to build a great church. What a, amazing it was. From there, I went to Somerville, Tennessee to plant a church, do, to do some mission work. Again, God blessed tremendously. From there, we went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, again, to plant a church, and God blessed tremendously. Many people were saved. When I was in Baton Rouge, I thought, you know, I think I'd like to have a high school education. I'm here I am already pastor in several years. I don't remember how old I was at that time. So I, I went to this place that was doing GED testing, and, and I asked them how you get one of those things. And, and they said, well, you go to these classes, and I don't remember how long it was, and then you take the test. If you pass the test, you get a GED diploma. It's just like graduating, she said. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And I said, can I just take the test without going to the classes because I didn't have much time. She said, no, you really need to, you need to go to the classes so you can pass the test. And I said, well, let me just take the test and see what happens. She said, okay. I took the test, and I'm blagging on God. Here's a guy that couldn't hardly read and write, couldn't pass the 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, and um, took the test. And I don't know how they do all this thing, but uh, the score level was second year college, and I didn't even go to class. Can God do, as Brother Curtis talked about this morning, the impossible? See, everything I've ever done in my life, he had to get the praise because I didn't know how to do it. I had no idea how to do anything, and he always, always got the praise. I, um, I guess one of the best things that happened to Linda is when I surrendered my life to God, too, because I quit drinking. I, uh, later, I could even quit smoking because I thought, you know, I ought not smoke because that's not good for children to see me smoke, especially a pastor, so I just quit smoking as well. I don't mind telling you, quit smoking was harder than quit drinking, though, and quit drinking was very hard, but quit, quit smoking was even worse. We've done, God's, God has, has done some marvelous things. From Baton Rouge, we went to Hooks, Texas, plant another church, and that work there, again, went extremely well. And then from there, went to... Um, Ruston, Louisiana, and uh, stayed with those people. That was my shortest ministry. I was only there, I think, seven or nine months. And the only reason for that is because the people wouldn't do nothing. Good people, good people. Sunday school superintendent would come in 10 minutes after we started, and I, and I mentioned it to him one time. I said, you need to get here on time. He said, Pastor, you need to learn to be patient. Well, after about seven or nine months, I couldn't learn how to be patient, so I just said bye and and they went on about their business. I went about my business. From there, I went to Piggott, Arkansas, England, Arkansas, Haynesville, Sherman, Texas, and God blessed every ministry. Sherman was one of the best churches I ever pastored, just a fantastic church. I was having a, a time of my life in Sherman, Texas. And then this guy down in um, Pasadena, Texas, Jack Spencer called me and wanted to know if I'd come down and help him with an evangelistic seminar. And I said, sure, because I loved doing that. I, loved, I was going all over the place teaching churches how to reach people, and I loved it a lot. So I went down and did an evangelistic seminar. And um, God was doing something kind of sneaky. But by the time I got down there, Jack had already resigned. Still there. By the time I left that seminar, God was already beginning to deal with me about being the next pastor. Having a great time in Sherman, Texas, and then he moves me to Houston, Texas. Now, I say this very respectfully, and, and I know somebody might get offended by this, but I don't say this to be offended. I don't like Houston, Texas. I'm sorry. Uh, I've been here 10 years, and I don't like it. I'm here because God wants me here, and I enjoy, I enjoy the ministry. I love my church family. I enjoy the ministry, and I will stay as long as God wants me to stay. I've tried to leave, and that didn't work too well. <laughs> and so he, I, I don't know. I, I guess because of all those bad things I did, i got to stay. I suppose that's it. That's my payment for the, all the sins that I committed. I don't know. But I'm here. I'm a country boy. Uh, I, 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 I would love going to, back to Calico Rock, Arkansas, pastoring where there's no red light. And, you, and you're driving low gear, and your life is in low gear. 
but um, that's okay. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. God's blessed in Houston, Texas. We, we had a great ministry and fellowship at Pasadena, and that prepared me for even more for what we're doing here. And uh, LifeBridge has been a great thing, and everything that God has done has just turned into such great blessings. I, by the way, I told you I didn't know what I'm doing. I'm still trying to figure it out. I hadn't got it all figured out yet. I'm still working on that. Would you look with me in Psalms 139? Psalms 139. This passage of Scripture spoke to me as much as any passage of Scripture ever has. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. In verse 1. Um, if you jump all the way down to verse 13 it says for you formed my inward parts you covered me in my mother's womb I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made (laughs) I don't want to get too um, um Um, I need to be careful with my words here, but I don't know how to say it. And I don't know how I was conceived. I might have been conceived in the back of a Ford pickup. I don't know. Don't know exactly who all that was that was involved in that conception. But God did. God used those two people to bring somebody into the world who would think that he was a nobody much of his early life to do what I'm doing today I wish somehow I could share with you how much of an honor it is to me that God chooses to use me I feel so unworthy but I'm grateful I am so so grateful the scripture speaks to me so much when it says I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works as I mentioned earlier much of my life I did not think I was a wonderful thing at all but later I found out that to God I I was wonderful (laughs) um that makes me feel pretty important and I think it should make anybody and everybody God created you for a reason and for a purpose and it's more than just breathe air in this life we all have a job to do every one of us I want you to know that God could have got by without me he could have chose somebody else to do all this stuff but I'm glad he didn't give up on me. He gave me many more chances. I could share with you the number of times that my life should have end, should have ended in automobile accidents. Um, I was pretty close to getting struck by lightning one time. It was so bad, it, it stopped my watch. Electrocuted almost under a house. Um, other things that's happened in my life that uh, God saved me from the when I broke my back three or four years ago I uh, really thought at the time when that four-wheeler was coming back that I would either be paralyzed or dead and uh, he saw me through that I remember not too long after that accident and I should not have done it but I think I said something along the words this to Linda and she got really upset with me I said if God don't fix me I wished he would take me because I did not want to continue to live and not be able to do anything for him but uh, he fixed it Rachel I thank you for finding that doctor he really saved my life 
but I am wonderfully made, the scripture says. I tried my best to destroy this creation. I tried my best to do all I could to, to get on a self-destruction destruction of life. And God just kept loving me and showing his love to me. It would not let me destroy my life. Praise to Him. It says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, verse 15, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. God is so good. He is so great. I want you to continue to pray for me. I don't know what God holds for the future. I am enjoying ministry January the 1st uh, you know I could pick out several different dates in my life that really mean a lot to me and I want all of you to know that January the 1st 2012 was a precious day God and I had had a lot of conversations before that day some of you from the old life bridge remembers every once in a while I would say I wish God would tell me what he's doing I wish God would tell me what he was doing all he would tell me is I've got it covered don't worry about it sure but God has been great souls have still been saved lives have been changed we'll baptize again supposed to have been denied and I got messed up on the date and I apologize Linda and Betty of course thank you for being patient with such a crazy pastor but uh, we'll baptize next Sunday evening must be a reason for that maybe there's somebody else that needs to be baptized as well I um, the future of Life Bridge, especially with the Celebrate Recovery Ministry, it's just going to be so exciting. So, so exciting. Would you stand with me as we offer thanks to God for His wonderful greatness? Father, I want to say thank you. I don't understand a lot but I do understand your love. I pray, Father, that you'd take the words that I have spoken this afternoon and you would just show everybody how great you are and what you can do in a person's life. I pray, Father, that each one would understand how wonderfully and marvelously they are made and I pray, Father, that they would permit you to work in their life so that they will not destroy their life and so that they can help others to experience your love as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.